Well, you know, everything that they, especially Tom said in his thank yous, I echo because it's been really, it's only been a day and it seems like I've been here longer than that. It's, it's really been a blast and everyone has been quite amazing. Well, thank you all and thank you for coming. Because I don't know how this is going to go. I've never given a, a big speech before. <laughs> At least only in my living room. But, <laughs> but it was just my cat. So. Um, hmm. Well, I'm not even going to really talk about my book much at all, except in a peripheral way. Um, years ago, I was an acting student, and um, I was on my way to school one morning, uh, and it was winter, and the snow was blowing sideways. I live in Chicago, and uh, I was hit by a car, and I found myself lying in a hospital uh, for months on end, wondering what my life would be like now that I was this disabled person, or handicapped as we called it back then. And uh, I didn't know any disabled people. I never saw them around, you know? And uh, occasionally there were blind people in the streets, but no one else, no one in a wheelchair certainly had access to the streets, and I, I just had no vision for my own future, you know? I didn't know what came next, because apparently nothing much came next, and, but I had seen disabled characters in books and movies, um, Quasimodo, Freaks, Laura Wingfield in The Glass Menagerie, um, who had a limp and was so traumatized by the limp that she barely left her home and uh, could barely speak most of the time because of the terrible shyness she was consumed by. And, um, and I remember thinking, I, a limp, you know? I wish I had a limp. And, uh, you know, Ratso Rizzo, Baby Jane. Uh, Baby Jane had a sister who um, was an invalid, and Baby Jane held her captive and put a dead rat in her lunch tray. And um, I just remember that this imagery burned in my brain over the years. Uh, was all I had, really, to go on when thinking about what my world would be like now. Has anyone ever heard of the Bechdel test? I bet you have, but um, Alison Bechdel is a cartoonist who's known mostly for this strip she does called Dykes to Watch Out For. And uh, some years ago, she became really disgusted with how movies uh, represented women. And she devised a test. It had three questions. If she couldn't answer yes to all three questions, she was not going to the movie. Uh, the first question was, does the movie feature at least two women? Do these women characters ever talk to each other? And the third question, do they talk about something other than a man? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I sense in thinking about what I went through and how consumed I was by, and how important to me the imagery around disabled characters was, because I didn't know any other. So I, I, um, decided to apply the same test uh, to any work, if I, 
any work of fiction, a book, a movie, a play. And since movies are more popular, and often based on books and plays anyway, uh, let's focus on movies instead of, and instead of women, substitute disabled characters. And my test might look like this. And in my test, all the answers should be no. Number one, is the disabled character inspirational, like Tiny Tim, or a villain like Dr. No? Two, is the di disabled character cured, killed, or institutionalized by the end of the movie? And three, does the movie's plot hinge on the disability? And I, I'm not including the question, is the disabled character played by a disabled actor? Because why bother? Um, so I'm wondering, can anyone think of a movie offhand? And you probably won't be able to think of one that you can answer no to these questions about, but um, with a disabled character, any movie at all. Forrest Gump. My Left Foot. Both Oscar winners for the best actor category. A Beautiful Mind. Right. Best Years of Our Lives. Well, these are very good answers. I came up with a few myself just to, to you know, remind us, like I think you just did, of the prevalence of, of disabled characters in film. Uh, Million Dollar Baby, Rain Man, and these are all relatively recent movies. Um, My Left Foot, Philadelphia, Forrest Gump. Oh, that was sad. Um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Midnight Cowboy, Scent of a Woman, Silver Linings Playbook, Shine, The King's Speech, Francis, Sling Blade, Children of a Lesser God, and F. Mice and Men. There was a recent, relatively recent remake of that. Um, so there are thousands of movies with disabled characters in them that exist. And already you can see how many of them are become extremely popular because of this issue of disability. And um, maybe, uh, you know, actually there, there was, um, there have been so many movies about disability that they, they actually go all the way back to the beginning of, of filmmaking itself. In 1896, or 86, Edison made a movie called The Fake Beggar which was about a, a beggar who pretends to be disabled because, you know, so duplicitous, in order to prey on, on the good intentions of passers-by. There were a whole slew of these beggar movies, fake beggar movies. Um, but in spite of all of these movies, we hardly ever look critically. I, I don't think we've learned how to look critically at these depictions, these metaphors. And um, the truth is, they're reoccurring in just about any movie I can think of with a disabled character. You get mostly a choice between victim or villain. A uh, victim is basically any character with a disability. Um, and there are good victims and bad victims. So like a good victim would be, for example, um, uh, well, Tiny Tim. And usually the good victims get cured miraculously at the, uh, by the end of the movie or somewhere in the movie. Um, so Tiny Tim was cured and Scrooge was redeemed. Uh, Forrest Gump's legs, literally I think, flew off his legs at one point film. 
And I remember that in Haydn, when this was another one of my the movies that I, I fretted over when I was a patient in the hospital. Um, in Heidi, she has this friend, and she teaches the friend to walk just because, you know, just by really trying harder. And that was great. That was, that, that was helpful for me. But sometimes uh, the good victims have to be killed because, like Quasimodo, for example, who was a good guy, a hero, in fact, um, he couldn't be normalized. And another character that comes to mind, not a heroic character, but an important one, an iconic one, Lenny in Of Mice and Men, who um, accidentally kills a woman and is shot by his best friend to save him from a worse fate by an angry mob. Um, so there was no place for this particular kind of disabled person. He had to be, he had to be ended at the end. Um, villains are, you know, bitter, of course, about their disabilities. So bitter, you know, that large numbers of people can be killed in order for them to enact their vengeance. Captain Ahab, for example. At Dr. No. Uh, Mr. Potter it wasn't killed at the end, because often villains just pretty much have to be killed. Um, he wasn't killed, but he was neutralized. Um, it was a kind of death. He, he was stripped of power. Remember Mr. Potter from It's a Wonderful Life? And these days, I think that uh, they've had to change up the cure thing a little because you can't have miraculous cures anymore. Not as much. So um, they have sort of morphed a cure into this notion of overcoming one's disability, as if this should be the goal for disabled people, to overcome. Um, and you get that particularly with movies about veterans such as Marlon Brando and the Men, where the character is normalized. And overcoming happens to a character in all sorts of tricky ways. I'm so parched. It's the weather. Um, you get these movies with uh, non-disabled protagonists through whose eyes you see the movie, uh, the disabled character that is, who uh, mm, will knock some sense into that disabled person, you know, and just, you know, n let them know they have to stop feeling sorry for themselves. <laughs> um, like there was this character in Wait Until Dark, does anyone know that movie? And I remember Audrey Hepburn saying, oh, do I have to be the world's best blind lady? And uh, her husband saying, yes. And uh, so, you know, she killed the, the killers, the bad guys, and hid behind the refrigerator. Um, OK, but um, one of my favorite sort of sort of weird cures in recent movies is in Avatar, where uh, the disabled character actually merges with his avatar body, which allows him to be cured and, you know, completely sort of re-sexualized. Um, I just thought that was an, a very creative approach to curing a character in the 2014s or 10s, or was that he was 2008 or something. Um, and then you get these, these typically, well, I'm not going to get 
the thing is, there are so many little um, ways of approaching how, uh, these movies. Um, when you're looking with a slightly more jaundiced perspective, like I do. Um, and particularly with the non-disabled protagonists, it's very interesting the way those characters are used as well. So I thought, just to show you how formulaic it is, um, we'll take a couple of the movies that I mentioned earlier. Uh, million Dollar Baby, Victim. Now, I'm just going to say whether she was a victim or a villain and how she ended. And has everyone pretty much heard the story or seen the story of Million Dollar Baby? Um, I worked at a disability rights organization at the time. We were thinking of protesting the movie, but uh, it was determined that we would simply be made fun of in the media because we were overreacting and had no sense of humor. And that, with Tropic Thunder as well, people were really upset. Um, but the Million Dollar Baby character was a victim by virtue of being disabled. And, um, Apparently, several weeks after becoming disabled, she decided she wanted to be euthanized and asked her friend to kill her, and he did. Um, Rain Man, victim, institutionalized. He was institutionalized at the beginning of the movie and um, at the end, of course, and in a very nice institution. You know, it was like institution light and um, enabling his non disabled protagonist brother to evolve as a person and become more understanding. So that's just a taste of the formula. And I find you can apply it to pretty much any movie with a disabled character and come up with pretty much the same formula. Uh, essentially, what we know about disabled people, I think, derives largely or often from the cultural iconography around us. And it's become so formulaic and so mundane that I think we've really internalized these ideas about who disabled people are when one encounters a disabled person. And, um, and I don't simply mean non-disabled people. I'm not speaking to non-disabled people here at all as, or exclusively. Um, I think this is this lack of, of critical thinking about these characters and these movies as a whole is something that we're all subject to. And when there's an encounter, let me tell you a story, actually. I have a friend, uh, his name is Mike, he's got muscular dystrophy. In fact, he was a, a poster child of yours. Uh, been a very angry disabled person ever since. Very angry activist. Um, and it started a group that protests the telethon every year. Uh, in any event, he was, he's also a writer. He um, was, decided he needed a cup of tea one day. He went across the street, got a cup to go, was standing at the intersection waiting to cross, and a guy came up to him. And of course, he was holding a cup, threw some change in the cup. But he had a, a lid on the cup. He had a lid on the cup. And the guy, to add insult to injury, said to him, oh, blows for business? 
So, you know, these kinds of encounters are not all that unusual. And they happen on many levels and degrees of severity. I would say that's a really large degree of severity, um, but funny. Um, and I had written a play once early in my playwriting career, and uh, so to speak, and it did very well. And I started getting calls from agents. And I, I had decided I, I'd really moved on from the acting thing, but um, my father encouraged me to go meet with these agents. And this one agent called me in, had me read the audition piece. You, you are given a few pages of the dialogue and um, put it on tape and send it to Los Angeles and, uh, you know, never to be heard from again. And so she gave me the, the pages and I looked at them and I, I said, well, I can't do this. I, I can't do this. And she said, uh, well, why not? I said, oh, the character was, uh, worked in an office and um, her job, well, she had a, a sort of a cart attached to her wheelchair, her power wheelchair, and she would drive around the office and say, donuts, donuts, those are my lines, and, um, <laughs> you know, it would be even better if this was exaggerating, but it's, it's not, and um, I said, I, I can't do it, and she was so outraged at my arrogance that I, you know, of course I was never called back, and this happened again and again, but I, I just, I like the donuts because it was such a, Um, but I think, as I said, our, our interactions, and when, even if we, if we know disabled people or we are a disabled person, we, uh, we uh, have to deal with this imagery in many, in the many ways that it impacts us every day. Um, and I guess I became obsessed with it after my, as I said, after I was trying to figure out my own place in the world after I became injured. Um, so what are some possible images, you may ask? <laughs> and I would have to say, I don't know what a positive image is, but I think if you were to ask an African-American person to name a film prior to 1940, say, with a positive image of an African-American character, um, they would be very hard-pressed to think of one. Very, very hard-pressed. And it wasn't until the Civil Rights Movement, and because of the Civil Rights Movement, the beginnings of African-American writers, because it's all about the writers, I think, um, being able to break through some years after that and um, be published novelists and playwrights, amazing playwrights, and, and make movies and act and perform, you know, all of these things which added enormously to our understanding, everyone's understanding of that experience, that because it was written by people who lived the experience. And I think, although, you know, movies are not the reason disabled people experience oppression or, you know, isolation by any stretch, it certainly serves to perpetuate and sort of buttress 
the isolation that we experience? And the answer is complexity, um, particularly to develop disabled writers or to hope that disabled writers will emerge somewhere from the messed up educational system that we have and be able to uh, put some words on paper and then break through. That's the hard part, is breaking through. Uh, what would an alternative look like? I think a story without, with a, a disabled character who is neither a victim nor a villain, who isn't interpreted or represented by a non-disabled protagonist, but who speaks to us directly, where the disabled characters are fully sexual. And finally, a story with a disabled character that's about something other than a disability. Even a story in which the disability, the presence of a disability, never comes up. Because as all of us in this room who have disabilities know, long periods of time do go by without us really thinking in a conscious way about our disabilities. There are, you know, we are consumed with all of the other cares and concerns and joys of daily 